So good afternoon, everyone. It's lovely to have you all with us. Uh, this is the second in our season of creation webinars for 2022. I'm delighted to welcome Steve Hollinghurst, who is the evangelism enabler with an environmental focus in the Diocese of Litchfield. And he will be talking to us about why evangelism and creation care are essential to each other. It's really great to have you here, Steve. Um, thank you very much. And I'm just going to hand over to you. Thank you. Thanks very much, Joe. As Joe explained, I'm, I'm going to share some slides uh, for a little bit, talk for 20 minutes to half an hour at the most, and then we'll open up for questions and discussion. So that gives you an idea of the format. And as Joe said, I will make the slides available. So let's get into sharing my screen. Okay, here we go. This subject, by the way, is something related, understandably, to my job. As, as Joe said, I'm Evangelism Enabler and Environmental Focus for Litchfield Diocese. And, and it, I think it's a unique role. I'd be fascinated to know if anyone else has a similar kind of role. I want to start by thinking about the words we use and a kind of a what's in a word kind of idea. So the word evangelism, well, anything with an ism is an ideology or often a practice. It's a, a way of doing things that, that's got a, a sort of an ideological background. And obviously, evangel is, is Greek for good news. So evangelism is the practice of the good news. I think we often have a lot of baggage around this word, uh, and, and some of that may be unhelpful. And, and in one sense, partly thinking about creation care and evangelism gets us to think about what do we think the good news is that evangelism is about and we have another ism environmentalism and the environment uh, comes from a french root environ uh, which is about the world we live in and the way things relate to each other so so in a sense environmentalism is the practice of the circumstances in which things live. We talk about an environmental crisis. And when we say that, what might we mean? There might be all sorts of reasons why there is a crisis in the environment. Uh, these could be natural reasons, volcanoes, uh, meteor strikes or something like that. But our current environmental crisis is very much about the way people live. And indeed, it, this is magnified by economic development. The reality is that while sometimes we have this idea of sort of ancient pastoral Brits uh, living in, in ideal circumstances with nature, actually the ancient Celts and Saxons did a massive amount of deforestation, but they couldn't do it on the industrial scale that we now can. So those issues are intimately connected. Sometimes people talk about the environmental crisis as if it's about technology and science, as if we got the science right or the technology right, we would solve the problems. But I think this ducks, and most environmentalists would agree with this, the real issue, which is that people need to change their lifestyles. Now, this is actually not something people find easy to do. Indeed, it's something clearly they don't really want to do. If it was as simple as saying to people, look, the way you live is damaging the environment, so change how you live, and people just went out and did it, well, we wouldn't be in the situation we're in. So we're in a situation where we're talking about how do people change? Why would people change? Now, we've talked about evangelism as good news. We know the bad news about the environmental crisis that people are not changing their lifestyles and we are continuing to damage the planet. So what might good news mean? And what might Christians have to offer in that world? What might we say is good news, evangelism, if you like, about the environment? And how might this affect how we understand evangelism and how might that change people and their lifestyles? Well, there's a whole issue here about whether Christianity is, in fact, good news for the environment. If, here's a quote, if God's new purpose in creating the universe was to establish a relationship with human beings and all other than human parts of creation are intended to simply prepare and provide for the human, then everything else is scenery. 
Uh, but this idea can come across that everything is about the human and God's interested in us. What about creation? One of the most famous articles written suggesting that Christianity was part of the problem and not the solution comes from a historian called Lynn White Jr. And this is from his seminal work, The Historical Roots of Our Ecological Crisis, back in 1967. Christianity not only established a dualism of man and nature, but also insisted that it's God's will that man exploit nature for his proper ends. Man's effective monopoly was confirmed by the old inhi inhibitions to the exploitation of nature, crumbled by destroying pagan an animism. Christianity made it possible to exploit nature in a mood of indifference to the feelings of natural objects. Uh, also, a very short quote from a pagan academic who I know called Graham Harvey, who told me that he, his understanding of Christian stewardship was that it meant that people could hunt their prey and pray their thanks. And this kind of view here of a dualism between humanity and nature that God actually institutes in creating humans in God's image. Well, is this the case? Let's unpack this a little further. Well, sometimes Christianity can be viewed as saving people from the world. And in fact, Tom Wright, in his book, How God Became King, which is a really useful book to read on this subject, talks about how the gospel often is portrayed as saving people from the world as opposed to saving people for the world. This is an image, if you like, of evangelism as sort of a, a project of saving people, a sort of an ark church in which people are dragged to safety from the dangers of the world and into the church where they're safe or saving people from a burning building. And if we we're going to use that kind of analogy, the problem when it comes to environmentalism is that you're saving the arsonists from the burning building into your safe church. And indeed, this theology can be compounded by the idea that the world is the kingdom of the of evil. It's controlled by the devil. So the only place good is to be found is in the church. And ultimately, this ends up with a vision that God is going to destroy the world. So why bother with environmentalism? And I have, in fact, heard it argued that because God is going to destroy the world, environmentalism is a distraction that Christians should not be engaged in. Now, in looking at this, I want to start by putting it within the framework of the five marks of mission, which are the mission statement of the Anglican Communion. Now, in my experience of going around Anglican churches over a number of years, many people do not know what the five marks of mission are. You who are listening now may be, well be exceptions to this, which might be why you're here. But anyway, the five marks of mission are as follows. Proclaiming the good news of the kingdom, teach, baptize and nurture new believers, respond to human need by loving service, seek to transform unjust structures of society and challenge violence of every kind and pursue peace and reconciliation, and to strive to safeguard the integrity of creation and sustain and renew the life of the earth. Now, these are to be understood as totally interrelated to each other. So what is it to proclaim the good news of the kingdom it is to proclaim a, a king, a world, God's kingdom, in which people respond to human need by loving service, tackle injustice and, and pursue peace, and it regard the safeguard of, of integrity of creation and renewing the life of the earth. And so the, the good news of the kingdom is to, is to help people become the very new believers who will do those things. So the whole thing is interlinked and connected. And in a sense, my role as evangelism and neighbor environmental focus is about that integration of environmentalism with the understanding of what the gospel is. So the good news, if it's not about the kingdom, is a truncated version of the gospel. And my fear is that very often we've had a very human focused understanding of evangelism and have ignored the wider implications of the kingdom of the God. Let's go right back and think a bit about our theology of creation, because I think it's very important in understanding this and human role within creation. So in the beginning, 
God. And I've chosen the Rublev icon there, which of course would not be chosen to represent God by a Jewish audience, but often by a Christian one. That idea of God and relationship within God. And indeed, creation flows out of that divine relationship and reflects the unity and diversity that is present in the Godhead. So there's a relationship between God and creation that is, in a sense, an intimate relationship. And in fact, the idea in missiology of Missio Dei, the mission of God, is founded on the same idea, that mission flows out of God's very character, as does creation. And indeed, both within Jewish and Christian theology, creation can be seen as the first act of the missionary God. And then he makes people. God made us male and female in God's own likeness. It is not good for man to be alone. We are made for relationships as God is relational. And our relationship therefore starts with creation and with each other. And there is a relationship to other creatures from right at the start where Adam is sent to look for a partner amongst the creatures. And it's quite interesting that whilst another human needs to be made to find a fully equal partner, the idea that there might be partners that Adam would work with in the rest of creation is not ruled out. Now, humanity in God's image is then told, uh, and in a sense is given a mission, to subdue the earth, multiply and fill it, and have dominion over it. Now, the problem is at this stage, this sounds rather like those very negative images of humanity's role in creation that we were looking at earlier that led to the kind of criticisms raised by Lynn White Jr. So we need to unpack a bit what's going on here. Subduing, multiplying and having dominion. Well, other creatures are told to multiply. So only humanity is told to subdue and have dominion. And this seems in the way it's put in the passage to be linked to us being in God's image as male and female. There are two uh, Hebrew words here. Subdue is kabash and dominion is rada, and these both pay a bit of looking at. So rada is used to describe God's rule as opposed to the rule of tyrants or the self-seeking rulers. It's a kind of rulership that is a protector and a shepherd. It's a self-sacrificial kind of rule, and, and that word is definitely used in that kind of way throughout the Old Testament. One could apply, in fact, Jesus' teachings on servant leadership to those who exercise rada. So in a sense, what humans are being told is have dominion in the way God has dominion, not as something overlording, but actually as a carer, as a servant. We've been, in a sense, as humans, given responsibility to look after creation on God's behalf. Kabash is a, little hard, a bit more difficult to work with because it simply usually does imply violence, although it can be used about subduing an enemy and protecting others. But if humans are made in God's image, are acting as God has done in creation, has in fact God been doing any subduing in the act of creation? Well, a strand of Old Testament theology would say, yes, he has. Uh, and this isn't completely obvious from the Genesis text, but becomes more obvious in other texts. So in a sense, Genesis here is a commentary on other Near Eastern creation stories. It's kind of saying, well, you know these stories that the other nations tell. Well, this is our take on it. And in that take, it wants to show how God's character is similar but different to other understandings. So a particular contrast here might be the Canaanite creation myth. And in that myth, the gods Baal and his sister Anat battle a seven-headed sea monster called Lotan, who lives in the waters and threatens to destroy the gods. And they defeat that creature, and out of its body they divide it and create the earth and the sea as separate things. And in some ways, therefore, the idea is that in the dividing of the waters in the Genesis account, an allusion is being put here to this Canaanite story and others like it. But the point being that rather than many gods acting within this, there is the one God in Jewish understanding, Yahweh, doing these things. 
This can be seen more explicitly in something like Psalm 74. Yet God, my King, is from old, working salvation in the earth. You divided the sea by your might. You broke the heads of the dragons in the waters. You crushed the heads of Leviathan. Leviathan is the name that's used instead of Lotan. And in fact, you'll find several passages that refer to Leviathan throughout the Old Testament. And these seem to range in a different understanding. So here in Psalm 74, Leviathan is in combat with God, but possibly destroyed by God. Uh, in, in other Psalms, there is one that in which Leviathan is God's creature made to sport in the waters and seems to be sort of harmless and friendly. In Isaiah 27, the battle with Leviathan is described as still ongoing and not going to be complete until the final day of God. And that imagery then comes behind the book of Revelation, where we see a seven headed dragon as the devil emerging from the sea to threaten uh, the, the woman and, and the child. So we have these human ideas of the idea of humans subduing the earth, multiplying and filling it, and having dominion over it. These might be viewed, for instance, in the terms of Genesis 2 as extending the garden, a kind of nurturing of creation so it flourishes, so that the thorns and briars become a paradise. And the garden here, of course, is not like a sort of an English country garden with a mown lawn and a nice rose border. It's something more like working with uh, creation in the Amazon or something of that nature, or, or in the, out in uh, the brush or the natural woodland. There's also a whole thing here, which I'm not going to go into fully, but people can ask some questions about it if they wish, about parallels drawn in Hebrew understanding between the Garden of Eden, the temple in Jerusalem, and the heavenly throne of God, room of God, which is like the ultimate temple on which both Eden and the Jerusalem temple are made. And with this, within this understanding, it's almost as if humanity has a priesthood in creation. Now, to have that, it's about bearing God's image, but also the image of the earth. And the word Adam, the, the name of the first human, comes from the word for earth. So we are creatures of earth and creatures of God's image, and therefore our perfect way to actually a enable a relationship with creation that is liberating and freeing. But east of Eden, we live in broken relationships. And it's worth noting here that those relationships are broken with God, with each other, and with the environment, and that the consequences of that damage the environment as well as damage us. So the mission of God in creation becomes about reconciliation, the mending of broken relationships. How might this work out? Well, we see partly its fulfillment in Romans 8. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the children of God. For the creation was subject to futility not of its own will, but by the will of the one who subjected it, in hope that creation itself will be set free from its bondage to decay, and will obtain the freedom of the children of God. And this is very much the high point of Paul's argument about the nature of salvation in Christ through the book of Romans. Now in this, creation is awaiting its adoption like humans, so it can also be like the children of God, exploring their liberty. And indeed, the passage in Romans contrasts humans groaning, waiting for their adoption, and creation groaning, waiting for this revelation of the children of God and it being set free from bondage to decay and enjoying the freedom of the children of God. So in a sense, actually, this puts us in a relationship with creation that's rather like creation as our brothers and sisters. And this, of course, is exactly what's expressed by St. Francis in the Canticle of the Creatures, where he talks about brother sun and sister moon and brother fire and sister water, and actually extends that beyond creatures into the whole of creation as brothers and sisters of God because of what has happened in Christ. So in a sense, God's mission is about the fulfillment of God's initial mission, which is to creation itself. It doesn't just stop with humans, but spreads out into the whole of creation. And humans are called to be part of this from creation to new creation.
Indeed, what Romans is suggesting to us is that until humans are transformed so that they become like the children of God, creation will never be set free from its own bondage to decay. The transformation of people becomes essential to the transformation of creation and is part of our human calling. And indeed, the proclamation of this vision then becomes the whole gospel and evangelism is a call to be part of the fulfillment of this mission. And the thing here is that, in a sense, unless we call people to this vision and allow God's spirit to transform them, we will never see it come to fruition. And so a Christian understanding would intimately link evangelism and creation care, not just because they're linked in the five marks of mission or something like that, but because without God's transformation of people so that they become like Christ, they will never live as those who will live well with creation. So we need to be transformed into Christ's likeness in order to fulfill our calling to creation and each other. And this can be understood rather in the same way that people approach things like intercultural mission. This is a very famous quote from Vincent Donovan's Christianity Rediscovered, but I think it's interesting to think how this might apply to evangelism and creation. Do not call, try to call them back to where they were, and do not try to call them to where you are, beautiful as that place may seem to you. You must have the courage to go with them to a place that neither you nor they have been before. Now, how might this look if it was not only about travelling with people, but with creation? What might that look like? How might we think of our mission in relation to creation as we might think of it in the context of another culture? And the point here being that just as what Donovan discovered was, he had to forge an authentic Maasai Christianity with the Maasai because he only knew how to do authentic Christianity in New York, where he came from. We have to think about how we have formed an authentic Christianity with creation in relationship with it. And how do we listen to creation uh, so that creation can tell us, in a sense, what it looks like to have a faith and a mission that is authentic. And I think here, as Nigel Rooms points out, mission is about the conversion of the church as much as it may be about the transformation of the world that we need to be challenged in our mission by the nature of creation and it's what it's saying to us to think about what an authentic Christianity is. I think there's also a thing here of learning from the indigenous and I found it very, very interesting um, finding Christian indigenous people groups around the world and their attitudes to the living with, with creation. I first came across this in a mission to Finno Ugric tribal groups from Estonia and then amongst First Nation American Christians. And the thing here has often been that these people had been told they must abandon their culture and tradition to become Christian. And what they're doing is a process of refinding their own cultures and traditions as part of the expression of their Christianity. Uh, so this comes out in the work of Richard Tr Twist, which I put a couple of books over there. Uh, Rescuing the Gospel from the Cowboys has to be one of the best titles I've ever known for a book on mission. It also is true for Aboriginal and Islander Christians in Australia. So looking at uh, rainbow spirit theology and rainbow spirit understanding, integrating their own understanding of the nature and their life living with it. And this leads to a more of an emphasis on living with creation as good neighbours, a sort of relational approach to the whole of the natural world. And it's very interesting when you get to places like Australia, that one of the challenges there is the lack of indigenous spirituality amongst the majority white settler population. And how, how might their relationships with the indigenous, how might the indigenous teach the white settlers to live well with the land. And actually, I think this is true for us too. In, in England and Britain, we're a long way from the kind of living with indigenous indigenism uh, that we might have been once. And I think part of our colonial legacy is that actually our identity as British and English became our identity as imperial. What might a post-colonial 
Christianity look like, where we actually become at home again in our own soil, but not as a, a white British group, but as indeed the multicultural nation that we are. And I think I talk about this as restoring the whole story of salvation. Western Protestantism has concentrated very much on this bit. And in fact, if we expand this out into how we live with nature, um, the need for salvation from environmental sin is very much apt and that transformation of people. But I think the whole story is scoped within the journey from creation to new creation. And actually, that is the full gospel story, not just therefore about the individual being saved, but the whole of creation being saved. And I think we have to get out of our very individualist mindset, which says that coming to faith is about me and my relationship with God, and often actually posits it as my relationship with God after I die when I go to heaven, rather than thinking about actually our relationship with God as heaven comes to us on earth as it is in heaven, as Jesus asked us to pray. And so the transformation of people is linked to the transformation of creation. I've already looked there at Romans 1, at Romans 8 rather. But 2 Corinthians 5, I think here is also interesting, where Paul talks about the new creation. And he it's quite a difficult passage to translate because he simply goes new creation, exclamation mark, exclamation mark. And English translators have to put in various other things. So is it there is a new creation or even there is a new creature or you are a new creation? But these are not in the text. They're all being added in by the translators. Uh, then he goes on to talk about the reconciliation of the world to God through the, through Christ. And there are a number of ways of talking about that, too. The safest is probably to say that the whole creation was reconciled to God in Christ or through Christ. Um, but actually, I think what Paul is implying in the passage, and it works perfectly with the Greek, is that the whole of creation is taken up into Christ through whom it was originally created and is actually therefore transformed and raised with him. So at the resurrection, the new creation starts and is gradually being worked out. It's almost as if you imagine that the, the hourglass of the world is tipped over and it starts flowing in the direction of the new creation. And this is very much the argument of Tom Wright's book, uh, How God Became King, uh, that I mentioned earlier, and I recommend that to you. So in many ways, Paul uses new creation in the way that the Gospels use the kingdom. Now, there's a whole debate here which surfaced last week in, in Margot's session. Um, as, but for those who weren't here, the, the, there is a possibility of two words that Paul and other New Testament writers may have used for new creation. Now, here, Paul calls it a kinekatesis rather than a neakatesis. That is the same creation made as new, not a replacement. So in a sense, in the environmental phrase, in God's understanding, there is no planet B. Now, it's actually also quite interesting to note that 2 Peter, which talks about the new creation emerging after fire has uh, purged the old one, is not, again, I think, talking about creation being destroyed and replaced, but being renewed. I think the interesting way to understand the difference between Nia and Kina is in Colossians 3. Do not lie to one another, seeing that you have stripped off the old self with its practices and have closed yourself with the new self, and here it's neon, which comes from Nia, which is being renewed, and now here it's a very long word, anakanumenon, but that comes from Kina. So there you've got the contrast between the new self which is the new self as born again, and, and Nia has very much a sense of the new baby about it. So that is the kind of contrast there. We're talking about the same creation renewed. So Christianity, rather than the image of saving people from the world, needs to be something else if we're going to understand our mission. I like to contrast this vision of the, the saving from the world as a bounded set understanding of conversion, in which the question is, is are you in or are you out? And evangelism becomes getting people across the line so that they are saved. 
I don't think this is very helpful for a number of reasons. Firstly, I don't think it actually fits with what the Bible is talking about as the process of conversion. Um, uh, and I think also it's very bad for discipleship. It tends to create an idea of the arrived as those within the church and the not arrived as those outside the church. I prefer instead to think of a, a vision of entering into the world to transform it. And these are pictures from the Christ We Share pack, to which I've added a picture of Jesus as the Druid, thinking about Columba, uh, talking about Jesus as his Druid in, in the uh, Celtic context. But the, the idea of these is that God enters in and transforms like the yeast that leavens the, the, the bread, rather than a kind of a, a, a transition process by crossing a line. It's a growth inside process. I liken this to what I call a centred set approach to conversion, where the question is not, are you in or are you out, but which way are you heading and how far have you got to go? And the goal is not becoming a Christian or joining the church, but being transformed into the likeness of Christ so we become fully the people God intends us to be. I think this is more realistic and indeed more theologically accurate. It enables conversion to be seen as a journey and evangelism as helping people along that journey. And evangelism and discipleship, in fact, become part of the same process of that transformation and helping others to be transformed. And while some people have an 180 degree flip, those immediate conversion experiences for others, it's a slower process. And of course, there is always more adaption to go. As we come nearer to Christ, we realise the direction needs to change further and how much further we have to go. And maybe this then is a spiritual and cultural conversion we're talking about that needs is needed to help the environmental process. And I like to think of this in terms of the Greek word oikos, home. What should our kingdom home look like? What should our economics be, our oikonomia, again, based on the word home? How will we live with those who we share the inhabited world with, which is the word ecumenism comes from and what will our ecology or ecologia look like and these are all about building home together and actually what is our vision for a home with all creation what needs to change for this to happen for a good vision to come about and how will this affect how we preach the gospel of the kingdom both in terms of language and content what kind of church will witness to this and how it operates and lives. Well, one of the things I've been experimenting with and others have as well is Forest Church. Uh, I, I'm not gonna say a lot about it now, but it's a, a not church outdoors, but Christian community with nature. And um, we've got some stuff online from Literary Diocese, largely because we had to create a way of enabling people to do forest churches in their own back gardens uh, when we couldn't meet together to do them during the pandemic. And that means there are some videos and things up there for you to use to get an idea of forest church if that's something you're not familiar with. So I want to end by saying I think evangelism in an environmental context is not getting people to church, but getting people to be church. Not taking God to people, but seeing what God is already doing in their lives and fanning that into flame. Not about getting people into heaven, but getting heaven into people. Not about saving people from the world, but allowing God to transform them as part of a plan to transform the world also. And not just about what happens to humans, but also about enabling the sharing of this paradise with all the other than human population we are called to share it with, who are welcomed as children of God through the ministry of Christ. And I might summarise this in the words of the Lord's Prayer. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. I'm now open for questions. I will stop sharing. Brilliant, well done. Okay, so the first question, concerning the larger picture, i.e. the whole story of salvation, we see something approaching this, don't we, in Acts, when the jailer in Philippi was baptized, he and all his family. 
I, I mean, I think it's a really interesting text because it, it's saying to us that there's a relationship um, between people and other people. So it's not just an individualistic thing. I think that's the emphasis of the acts. And that was exactly what Vincent Donovan had to cope with, with the Maasai, uh, is that they, because they thought tribally, um, when he was teaching them, uh, he wanted to baptize the individuals who responded to the teaching. And they said, no, 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 you baptize all of us or none of us. So it's a very similar thing. And what we're doing is extending that in a sense to the understanding of our relationship with creation. That's great. Thank you. Um, and then something for the from the chat and from the questions, essentially, is what does that look like in practice? I, I share with you some of my vision here, and, and it's it's starting to work out, but it does it in fits and starts in reality. So part of my my vision for what I'm doing in Litchfield Diocese is trying to start forest churches not just as a way of helping people to worship with nature, but actually integrate their spirituality with the natural world and start to think about the implications of that. And what I'd love to see is those forest churches as communities that both witness to the church about what it is to live our spirituality out with the world around and, and the natural world and the environment, but also connect out to those who are also caring for the environment as a way of prompting the, the important part of spirituality in that, that living out. I think it's very interesting that groups like Extinction Rebellion have a very significant spiritual and religious wing to them as that just emerges out of nature and there's something like forest church just i think gives a place to integrate those ideas of christian faith and the natural world thank you um and i think um there's another question how does forest church do evangelism but i think you've answered that and so unless you think there's anything else you want to add to that we'll take that one off as well i think that's how it should do it i'm going to be completely honest and say it doesn't always and and people are open and quite happy to disagree with me from Forest Church as well. Okay, lovely. Thank you. Um, so here's a. Um, Mike is asking where can we read about the bond the bonded bounded set and the centered set ideas? And then someone has suggested. Oh, it's the same person. <laughs> He's suggesting is you know, Graham Tomlin's the ever widening circle is a good place to read about humanity being priest to creation. Oh, um, thanks for pointing that out, because I've not read that, Mike. Um, but as to the bounded set, centred set, I've written this up in two places. And indeed, it's part of a wider thing, looking at different approaches to understanding the world around us. Uh, I think one of the, the... So I'll point you to the first place I wrote it up, which is my own 2010 book, sorry for the advert, Mission Shaped Evangelism, which looks at a whole range of issues to do with mission and culture, including mission and creation. So it's in that book, uh, which is Canterbury Press. Um, it's also the, in the first chapter of a book of Christian pagan dialogue called Celebrating Planet Earth, where it's developed a bit further. That's actually also an interesting read, um, looking at issues of creation across the, the pagan Christian relationship. Okay, thanks. Um, before we go, Steve, can I ask you to type that in the chat? Um, then we've got it. After yeah, the I'll, I'll do that. Keep going for the moment. Felicity says, shouldn't every diocese have somebody like you? Well, I think yes is the answer. I mean, I, I think it is an interesting journey because they were really thinking what the mission team should look like in Litchfield Diocese around the time of all the school strikes and climate rebellion and all those kind of things. And I think it just got people thinking, where is this kind of stuff in the Christian agenda and our understanding of mission? And I think that's how this post was born. But I think actually it leads to a really integrated understanding of evangelism and mission that's really helpful. Thank you. Um, Rod is asking, is our evangelism today impaired by the church's historical neglect of creation care? I think the simple answer is very much yes. Um, and, and I think that's in two ways. It's partly it's impaired our evangelistic theology so that we have a view of the good news as pertaining to people and individuals rather than pertaining to the coming of the kingdom of God. I think it's also impaired by the fact that our historical witness 
has been poor. And of course, this doesn't just apply to creation. It also implies to things like colonialism and the way the church has sort of implicitly blessed it and things like that. So some of our history, it does not help us look good at all. And we're often having to, and I find myself when I'm with people in the wider environmental movement, having to sort of make a case for why Christianity has anything to offer at all, because it's often automatically dismissed because of its history. Yeah, thank you. And I think um, somebody is saying, uh, oh no, I can't find it now, don't worry. <laughs> um, Nicola is asking, I'm interested in Celtic Christianity. Celtic Christianity. Can you expand on this, please? Uh, okay, I mean, I think anything said about Celtic Christianity comes with a massive caveat in that we know very little about ancient Celtic Christianity. Um, and a lot of what we think we know is medieval interpretations of it, or in fact, modern interpretations of it. Now, in one sense, that's not a particular problem. Uh, I, I think what I would say about Celtic Christianity is that it comes from an early phase of the church where um, the idea was that you indigenized very strongly the way you created churches. So the Martoma church in India comes also from that period um, where you actually have a thoroughly Indian culture church. So you've got a, a church very much at home in the context of the British Isles that has its origins in the conversions that happened when the Romans occupied Britain for 400 years. Uh, so that that is, is its kind of roots. Now, in, in modern understanding, it also has a, a close relationship with nature. Now, this is actually debated by historians looking at the Celtic church, how much that was true. Um, but I think in one sense, actually, if the ancient inspires the contemporary to actually have a good na positive nature connection and a spirituality that sees God in creation, which I think is what it does, that's a good thing, even if it isn't actually historically accurate. That's very interesting. Um, and I think that touches on, well, uh, leads us to the next, this question I'm going to come to. Gethin says he's just back from the World Council of Churches Assembly, where he was very inspired by the witness of Indigenous people there. It seems mm. to me remarkable that so many Indigenous people are Christians, even though it came to them via people who destroyed so much of what they held dear and destroyed so many people. What do you think Indigenous people find in the gospel that the rest of us tend to miss? Uh, that is a really interesting question I, and I can only speak from the indigenous people groups I know some of uh, which would be uh, First Nation Americans and Aboriginal and Islander people so I, I when I've spent some time with Aboriginal and Islanders now firstly they have very different uh, views so you can find Aboriginal and Islander Christians who very much think their previous culture was bad and they were saved from it. Um, but I'm talking now about those who actually have integrated more their previous culture. And what they would say is that their own natural religion and way of living with the world prepared them to receive the gospel. Indeed, I've heard Aboriginal and Islander Christians argue that their own stories are their own Old Testament. And it meant that when Christian missionaries came and told them about Christianity, they went, oh, yeah, this is what we've been waiting for all along, because this is the fulfillment of what we already believe. And I've heard very similar tales from First Nation Americans. So a sense that God was at work sharing the gospel through their own indigenous beliefs and culture. Now, this idea is not novel to Christianity, because it's very much from Justin Martyr in the early church, talking about the Greek philosophers as schoolmasters for Christ, that Greek philosophy in Plato and Aristotle actually prepared people to receive the Christian message. So there's this idea that God's at work out there, and actually getting back to discussion of Celtic Christianity, exactly the same argument would be there, that Celtic belief and culture prepared them to receive Christianity and express it in a way that reflected it. Yeah, thanks. I think that um, something that's really inspired me in my walk is this idea that um, our responsibility is to get with the programme, if you like. God is busy at work and we need to join in rather than think that we've got the programme and God joins in. 
Uh, absolutely. And, and this has been a revolution that's been going on in mission thinking with the idea of the Missio Dei coming to the fore. Um, to paraphrase Jürgen Moltmann, the idea is not that the church has a mission, but the missionary God has a church. I do. I like that very much. OK, so I think this follows on, really. Um, I am a bit picking and choosing my questions. I'm sorry, because there's too many. We're not going to get through them all. Stella says, some of the hardest places to share faith is in or among groups of environmental campaigners because we are not expected to be there as Christian people. Um, what would turn this around? What were the levers that worked in Litchfield? I, I would love to say I've cracked this one. <laughs> um, and and I, I think, I mean, I think there are a number of issues here. Firstly, there's the way we talk about our vision for the world. And we're never going to make Christianity attractive if it looks like about saving people from the world rather than saving people for the world. So I think that, and I think this is why, you know, evangelism and creation care is central to each other works both ways. Uh, it actually has to transform our evangelism as well as thinking about how our faith might transform our world and our culture. I think the other thing is that, in a sense, if what I am saying is true, Christians who get a real vision for the way of the kingdom of God living with all of creation actually will be transformed by the spirit to live very ethically with creation. And I think this is where we can learn, actually, from from indigenous Christians on how they live with the world around. I, I'm just starting to read a, a book by a, a First Nation American Christian called Randy Woodley, which is about our lifestyle practices of living with creation. I, I haven't read it yet, so I don't know what it says, but it looks very promising. So I, I think it's, it's going to be we're going to be judged on how we live and what we say about faith. But I think there is also a sense in which the environmental movement itself knows that lifestyle change and spirituality and morality are the key rather than technology. Yeah, that's really interesting. Thank you. I think this um, leads a little bit to this next question. Uh, wondering if you're setting the bar too high. <laughs> is the bar... <laughs> the threshold to faith much higher if we integrate creation care with evangelism a gospel of as in evangelism interpreted to mean a gospel of personal salvation in the context of a consumerist individualist mainstream culture moving away from a comfortable therapeutic solve my personal spiritual crisis problem kind of gospel um, what's attractive to the ordinary hard-working people in this full gospel I, I like the question because of the way you've actually put that that idea of the therapeutic gospel. Uh, and and I think there's a really interesting thing here about the gospel as fitting in with what our culture is asking. And our culture probably does ask for a therapeutic gospel. And then actually the gospel is a challenge to be inspired by the vision of the kingdom of God. And I would say part of the problem is it's too easy to offer God as a personal therapist uh, in whatever way we want to uh, as, as an attractive gospel. I, I, I'm struck here rather by the, the image that John Wimber once used of uh, Christianity is often offered as if it's a ticket to get on a cruise liner. And then the, the, the new recruits are very surprised when they get to the quay and find it's a battleship. But that, that the idea that actually faith should be challenging. But in a sense, do we just want a therapeutic gospel? Do we want Christians who become Christians for what they can get out of it? And I would say our, part of our problem in the church is we've had too much of that. And then we wonder why Christians don't make the difference they should. That's very interesting. It's challenging, isn't it? Um, I. I wonder if um, we think that people want a therapeutic God, but actually there's people who want to see Christians and see God as challenging those things. And they're busy. They're doing that. I think of the young people in my home <laughs> who really want to see action and change uh, and are not really interested in God or Christians if they're just going to be nice people and go to church. 
I, I think that's a good point. And actually, this fires back into the question earlier about how we share faith with environmental activists. I'm sure environmental activists are not looking for a therapeutic Christianity. They want a transformational Christianity if they want one at all. Yeah, that's kind of where I was going with that thought. Mm. Um, Barry says he particularly liked your thoughts about the kingdom, um, but there are still lots of isms out there and they may need to be confronted. Yes, there are lots of isms out there and some of them are inside the church and some of them are outside the church. Um, I, I think it's interesting to think of the isms that might need confronting to have a proper vision of the kingdom. I, I think one of the big ones we've labelled already is consumerism. Uh, is probably the most damaging thing to our planet and actually our lifestyles. And the problem is sometimes that the church can co-opt into it. Uh, our society actually, I think, wants to make faith a consumer product. In fact, it wants to make everything a consumer product. So I suspect consumerism may be the real biggie that we need to tackle to have a vision of the kingdom. But there are others. Yeah, thank you. Um, and I'm going to finish with this. Um, so there's a couple of questions. I think um, in, a, in a way your whole talk has been answering them, but I wonder if you can um, sort of sum it up. So somebody's saying, what would you say to someone who says Christianity is about saving souls, not saving the world? And someone else, um, the mindset of the church seems to be wholly occupied with getting people into the kingdom and into church. So how do we counter that? So really what I'm asking you to do in the last two <laughs> minutes is sum up your entire talk just to finish us all off. <laughs> yeah, so I hope it doesn't finish you off <laughs> in that kind of way. Um, I, I think, firstly, I'm, I'm exactly countering the idea that it's about saving souls. I, I think the, this, this has to be countered all the way down in our theology. And I think we start with the idea of the resurrection of Christ. And the reason we have a resurrected body, not a disembodied Christ floating around, is because in Jewish understanding, the body and the soul were inseparable. So actually, you have to have a resurrection of the body. Uh, and it's the, therefore the transformation of the body that counts. And if human resurrection in Christ means anything, it's again, it's the resurrection of the body. But also, I think Paul has a very strong emphasis on the new creation coming here and now, not just after we die. And the idea of rebirth in Christ is an embodied rebirth. So I think we desperately need to have an embodied and then an in creation, if you like, theology to be true to what is being said in Scripture. And, and we've had tended to have a soul view, which is actually Greek philosophy and not Christianity at all. Um, the emphasis on church growth, I find this deeply disturbing because it's the wrong goal. Um, actually, I think we should be trying to grow the kingdom. And I think actually, if we sought to grow the kingdom, and I mean by that the transformation of all creation so that the kingdom of God comes within it, then actually we would see the church grow anyway because it would be attractive. But it's about the church going out, not people coming in. Uh, and I can understand why the emphasis is there. The church is in losing people. It's losing money. It looks very precarious. But if we're not careful, it looks like trying to shore up the ship purely for its own sake. And I, I think that's deeply unhelpful. Well, thank you. That I think as a place to finish, as a <laughs> as a picture for the whole church and where we're going and where we all need to be, not just the, those of us in the church who care about creation and environment but those of us in the church who care about the church uh, and want to see the god's kingdom come uh, so a great place to start thank you very much steve um thank you everyone i know we didn't get to all of your questions um i hope that you found answers in some of the other answers that were there um i'm just gonna hang on here with steve while he writes down a couple of the interesting um books that he thought would be worth reading um, and then I can save the chat function and I can share it with you later. So, but you are all welcome to leave at this point because um, you don't need to be here while Steve is typing. <laughs> no, all the best. <laughs>